Welcome to Family Bible Time. Well, we are on our own this morning. Somebody has a science lesson and I have to go and I won't be back till tonight. Late, so Karison's going to have to do her family Bible time, like the rest of you watching yeah. it later. <laughs> We're in Song of Solomon, chapter 2. We are in Hebrews, chapter 2. So let's pray and let's find the right page mm -hmm. and let's go. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of... Uh, studying your word, we pray for your help now as we do so. We pray that you would watch over us, teach us, lead us in the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Now, there we are, straight into interpretation. You've probably heard Jesus mm -hmm. called the Rose of Sharon. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because people come to the Song of Solomon and they interpret the Song of Solomon as a love song between Jesus, mm -hmm. the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. Now, that's a very nice idea apart from the fact that it gets a bit awkward with the sexual aspects of his love. But it's, a, it's, it's kind of a nice idea. Um, the, the scriptures speak, as, speak of me, Jesus said, and um, you know the entirety of the Old Testament obviously is pointing to Christ, you say, in, in one sense. Yes, all of that agreed. However, not every verse is speaking about Jesus. And when we're going to say that it points to Jesus, we need something somewhere in the text itself to say this points to Jesus. Or you'd say, well, the inspired authors of the New Testament could give us uh, an ins you know, inspired... Um, inspired application of an Old Testament text which is not actually in its original sense speaking about Jesus but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the authors of the New Testament were inspired to apply that the, that text and the truth of that text to Jesus um, that's maybe another possibility, but to say it is speaking about Jesus and one of the names of Jesus is Rose of Sharon, mm. you've got to have something somewhere in the text itself. Now the problem is, you'll see this as we go through, mm. it isn't there. Mm. And that's why I said yesterday, I'm taking this as just a love song between bride and groom, between um, and uh, you know, with these attendants, the, the congregation or the, the friends, as they're called sometimes, others <laughs> in the ESV. Here. So, um, I would just challenge you if that's the way you've always interpreted it, that's the way I always interpreted it that this is a love song between Christ and his bride, because that's the way I was told. However, hermeneutically, that way of interpreting the Bible is really a hangover from a Roman Catholic um, system of interpretation that goes right back to the early church days when early church um, Greek-speaking, Greek philosophy-educated teachers were embarrassed about some parts of the Old Testament like Song of Solomon, and decided that the best way to deal with them was to spiritualize them instead of, instead of give, allowing them to have their natural meaning driven by the text in its context. Mm. They spiritualized it. So suddenly all this, this is kind of spiritualized to speak about Christ and the church, and we no longer have to deal with the awkwardness about the sexual love of a man for a woman, a woman for a man, only you do, <laughs> because it's still there. Mm. Okay. 
Right. As a lily, uh, verse two. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His hand, now she's kind of imagining what it's going to be like to be embraced by him and and uh, when they're married. His hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So don't awaken love, romantic love, especially sexual love, before it's time. I guess she's saying um, that she's imagining what it's going to be like. She's looking forward to being married to him. She's imagining what it's going to be like to be held and embraced by him and caressed by him and all of that. And, and she's just saying to the girls, oh, don't, this is, this is hard. <laughs> don't, don't start thinking about this. Don't awaken this love before it's time. <laughs> okay, verse 8. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, and the time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs. Oh, sorry, this is his voice, isn't it? Um, my beloved Just, speaks and says to me, Arise, my love. It says the bride adores her beloved here, so I think it is the woman's also. Yes, but she's saying that, and then she says, My beloved speaks and says to me, quote, Oh, oh yes, yes. yes quote, yes. verse 10. <laughs> Sorry, different voice. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. It's a lot less romantic the other way around. <laughs> but behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone, and flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are, f are in blossom. End quote, according to the ESV. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He grazes among the lilies. I'm guessing that means he grazes his sheep, rather than he's <laughs> eating <laughs> lilies. Pastures Until his pastures his fox, that's the footnote, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on, a, on cleft mountains. Now you can begin to see some of the difficulties of saying the beloved is Solomon. And, okay, so was Solomon a shepherd? Well, you never get that picture in uh, the, the books of kings <laughs> um he's just I, I so i don't know he's grazing his sheep maybe solomon did maybe david sent him out to graze mm -hmm. sheep to to learn what he learned as a child it's just not written for us but maybe okay anyway mm -hmm. um so if you see why some people would say, oh, it's a love song dedicated to Solomon. Okay. We'll keep going with the idea that it's a love song. Okay. And I'll get carried away in any direction. All right, Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> Therefore we must 
pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we just drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, stop there for a second and just take this in. Um, You've got to reckon with the fact of what's being said here. Look, the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. It's talking about the Old Testament. It's given through angels. It's, it's, it's tested. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. And when the people sinned against God, when the people broke his law and sinned against the Old Covenant, they met the consequences God punished them Mm. so now what his point is okay well now here is the salvation that's been put forward which is built upon the Old Testament it's the it is this the promise that the Old Testament made that there would be this Messiah there would be this deliverer the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as John the Baptist put it okay how do you think you're going to get away with it if you walk away from such a great salvation? Do you think that ignoring that, do you think that just delaying it is going to, is going to mean that God somehow ignores the fact that you're, you're resisting and rejecting what he's provided by way of salvation? Mm-hmm. Verse 3 continued. It was declared at first by the Lord, that means the Lord Jesus, and it was attested to and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, the, the Greek here is not doesn't mention gifts, it just is simply distributions of the Holy Spirit, literally. Mm. Um, So the the point is here, very simply, that those miraculous things that happened in the early days of the compiling of the New Testament, when the New Testament scriptures are being given, were there very specifically to bear witness. God also bore witness do you remember reading about the signs of an apostle? So the apostles themselves were accredited, they were attested to by the miracles that they performed. They were the signs that showed you that, oh, this is an apostle, wow. And he's bringing authoritative truth. I better listen to this. Well, this is another way of saying the same thing. God bearing witness so that there were those who attested to to what had been given by the Lord and God then bore witness to their attestation, their testimony, um, when he gave all those signs and wonders and various miracles and distributions of the Holy Spirit the giving of the Holy Spirit according to his will. Okay, um, now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. Do you remember from yesterday the subject that we're still on here is Christ's superiority over angels. Mm. Now it was not to Mm. angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we're speaking, it's been testified somewhere, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the Son of Man that you care for him. You made him you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, talking about Jesus, but we see him who for a little while, was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, 
crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So this is actually interesting, a little rhetorical device that's used throughout this passage. But we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. And you'll see that again and again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, consider verse chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, brothers, you who share in the heavy, heavy, heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Actually, in the original it would be, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus, and that happens throughout the book of Hebrews. It's like, da 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 Jesus. Anyway, I'll try and point them out to you when we, when we get to them. Um, well, that it just shows you what he's trying to do in this passage and throughout the book of Hebrews, is he's talking about all these, he's kind of comparing Jesus to well, in this case, angels, and then you'll see in chapter 3, Moses and the law, and then the high priest in chapter 4, and so on. And he just, one by one by one, he's saying that Jesus is the, the fulfillment of all this. Jesus is, is, the, is the culmination of it all. Jesus is the, the great one. He's greater than all these things that we've been given before. And why is he saying that? Well, he's writing to the Hebrews. They'd received, the, they'd had angels reveal stuff to them. They'd received Moses and the giving of the law. They'd had the high priests and so on, and, and the sacrificial system. And so they need to understand that Jesus is better than all of that. Well, we're going to get into that a lot. Mm. Verse 10. Um, for it was fitting that he, that's Jesus, for whom and by whom mm -hmm. all things exist, mm -hmm. so everything exists for God, for Jesus, and by Jesus, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their son, oh, sorry, this is talking about God, not Je God the Father, not Jesus. For it was fitting that he, for whom and as in God, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the found, founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Mm. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin or source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. All right, let me see how much time we got. Stop there for a second. This is just fantastic. So he who sanctifies, that's God, Jesus, and those who are sanctified all have one source, one origin. So he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Jesus, not ashamed to call us who are being sanctified Brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Think about it. Jesus. These are prophetic scriptures from the Old Testament. Jesus taking delight in the thought that... Here he is with all the children God has given him, God the Father has given him. Think of him saying, I'm going to go and tell of your name to my brothers. Mm. And he's thinking about mm. us. What? Well, obviously brothers and sisters. But that's, mm. it's just their short way of speaking mm. of it. It's no insult to the women. Mm. Now... This is incredible, and it just continues now, verse 14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, who's he talking about? He's talking about us, since we have flesh and blood. He himself, likewise, partook of the same things. Now, this is interesting. It's language you need to understand. 
to partake in something um, it is to, to, to take a part in it. So if you come into the kitchen here one day when my lovely wife has made a, a beautiful meal and you say, hmm, I might partake of a little of that. You'd be saying the right thing. I'll, I'll, I'll take a bit of that. That doesn't mean that you're... Um, you're the meal or you're uh, it doesn't mean that you're the same as everyone in this family but you're taking part in the same thing and that's Jesus so here he is God very God God the one through whom everything was made he upholds the universe chapter 1 verse 3 by the word of his power he's the exact imprint of he's the radiance of God's glory the exact imprint of his nature mm -hmm. and yet we have flesh and blood and so Jesus partook of the same things he came down and he said I'm going to take part in that I'm going to have flesh and blood that, and here's the reason, the purpose of him becoming flesh, the purpose of him being born as a baby and living as an ordinary human, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. Stop there for a second. Jesus became flesh in order to die. Mm -hmm. Never let anybody try to tell you that the cross was an accident, mm -hmm. that it was all a big mistake, that, you know, Jesus was a good man and sadly the Romans got him. Mm. Or sadly the Jews betrayed him. No. He became flesh in order to die. Why? So that um, he, he could destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And that's talking about us. So he's delivering us from this fear of death and slavery to our sins, mm -hmm. which is part of our human condition. Verse 16, surely it's not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He's talking about us. Well, he's talking about the Jews. He's writing to the Jews. Therefore, he has to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a faithful and merciful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, lots more on that frame to come. Let's just nail it very quickly. He's made like us, mm -hmm. verse 17, so that he can become a merciful and faithful high priest. High priest, he goes up back up to God the Father and he is interceding for us on our behalf. He prays for us. Mm -hmm. And more than that, he makes propitiation for us. That means he, he presents to God the sacrifice that he made, which takes away the wrath of God. That's what propitiation means. A wrath removing sacrifice. And then because he himself has suffered when tempted, so Jesus was tempted like us, he suffered, he found it hard, he found he experienced the pain of it all. He's able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, you find it hard. Mm. You suffer. You have to give up things in order to be righteous. It hurts you to say no to temptation sometimes there are consequences but Jesus has been there so he can help mm. you mm. Lord we pray that you would help us day by day that you'd be with us and lead us and teach us and transform us please by your your word as we have our minds renewed we pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. alright I'm going to say goodbye <laughs> I'm going to hit the road I'll go to work and these girls will get on with that. Bye for now.